step one is this. Despite your best teaching methods and interventions that work for your students, somehow they're not working for one of them. Actually, when you got one out of 10 kids, maybe have ADHD, you probably got two or three of them in class. But the step one is your recognition that uh, something's going on with this youngster and you're not sure what's going on because you really are doing your best and, um, and you have probably tried different interventions, but somehow for this particular kid, it's not working. And what, what do you see academically, socially, behaviorally? You know, if, if it's ADHD kinds of things, it's inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. Um, you know, academically, um, the child, you know, uh, in, in the broad sense, is not completing tasks. Uh, they can't pay attention. They um, are impulsive, and they either um, keep learning out the answers to questions you're asking, or they're impulsively playing with things, uh, talking to somebody else bothering somebody else. Um, socially, uh, uh, kids can be, with ADHD, can be very social, interested in being social, but it's kind of like they don't know when to stop. Um, kids may feel like they're, they're always um, kind of in their face, or they can be very um, reactive emotionally, so if things aren't the way they think they should be, they can get upset very quickly. Um, um, a lot of kids with ADHD, um, the inattention could be that they don't have the hyperactivity and impulsivity, but they could be looking at you and the head could be going up and down, and they have no idea what you're saying. You know, they, they are not focused on you. Uh, or they could, uh, many kids with ADHD uh, are very slow getting work done, need repeated directions, and even with that, things are not so good. Um, we'll also talk about how do we know if it's ADHD. We'll talk about treatment. Uh, briefly, we'll talk about psychotherapy, accommodations, medication, coaching, complementary treatments. Uh, we'll, um, then helping the student with ADHD, we'll talk more about uh, accommodations and behavioral issues. How do we know it's ADHD? So how how is a kid who has ADHD different from what's called the uh, neurotypical, right? So it's somebody with ADHD, maybe somebody who's called, you know, maybe may neuroatypical. In neuro, because ADHD is a neurobehavioral um, disorder, um, it's uh, not, you know, learned behavior. Um, it is generally, I mean, it's ADHD itself, it's highly, highly genetic, uh, as genetic as is height. And if a kid has ADHD, the likelihood that one of the parents has ADHD is um, like 50%, I think. And the question about how is it different from being neurotypical, because many of the things that I might describe, one might say, well, all kids are like that. You know, all kids don't pay attention at times, or all kids get hyperactive or get impulsive at times. You know, what makes it a kid who is ADHD, um, ADHD, right? And it is true that being ADHD, it, it's not abnormal behavior. It's not, you know, having hallucinations, you know, it, it's not having delusions, it, it's not crazy behavior. Um, it is kind of the typical behavior that you would see for most kids. But uh, most kids who are ADHD, they do it, they be engaged in the behavior a whole lot more often than other kids might behave, uh, be involved in that kind of behavior. And it's causing problems. So um, if you're a teacher, you've seen different kinds of behavior rating scales. And I, I, when I uh, am diagnosing or, or evaluating a child, I should say, uh, it's behavior rating scale. There's no one test or five tests that you can do with the kid and say, oh, he's ADHD. Um, the, uh, there are different computer-based tests out there, uh, but, but they're not used. Uh, I used to use one called the Gordon Diagnostic System. A kid could do great on it. And if I wasn't sitting there watching, I wouldn't have seen that the kid kind of punches the button, gets up, walks around the table, touches something on the shelf, comes back, punches it again, kind of goes around, comes back to it. Um, well, he doesn't look like he's impulsive when you look at the results. Oh, look, he waited between his responses and all this. No, he's definitely ADHD. He's all over the place. Um, so uh, those kinds of things don't work. It really is behavior rating scales, and it is uh, getting a good history. Um, other kinds of behaviors that may have been associated with ADHD when they were younger. 
Uh, but you can gathering all this information, um, which um, in, in um, I tell parents, you know, uh, if your child has ADHD, even if I think they do, it's because there's no blood test for it. There's no other test for it. It's, it's really uh, what you see in the classroom, what you see at home and, and, and putting it together like that. Um, so you, you have to be a, doing a good evaluation. The question, does it need to be diagnosed? Well, um, uh, no, actually, um, I assume in most areas of the country, I, I know in this area, uh, if the child is having problems with executive function skills, which we'll talk about in a moment, you don't, uh, they don't have to have a diagnosis of ADHD to be eligible for a Section 504 plan because uh, executive function like sustained attention, uh, listening and concentrating, if it's affecting school, um, it, you don't have to have that diagnosis uh, to be able to have accommodations for that youngster. So it's very important to remember. So sometimes I'll see kids who, yeah, they have a lot of these traits, but no, nobody's really saying that this is causing significant problems for the youngster. So you may not diagnose ADHD. I may have recommendations for things that can be helpful, but it's not a diagnosis of ADHD, at least at the present time. Sometimes uh, when kids are younger, um, you know, they're smart enough, they can do okay. But once fourth, fifth grade comes along, when it's not about uh, learning to read, it's you have to read a lot to learn, that's where they start running into issues. Uh, you can see the next question, is it ADHD and or something else? The majority of kids with ADHD don't have just ADHD. There's generally something else going on. ADHD is not a learning disability. ADHD, um, like if you talk to adults, they'll say, well, I can, I can read just fine. I just can't keep my mind on what I'm reading. So uh, I have to reread the page multiple times before I, I remember it. A learning disability in reading, the person always has a learning disability in reading. It doesn't matter what they're reading, really. If you have ADHD, it's consistently inconsistent because sometimes the kids are on and sometimes they're off which can be frustrating because you know the kid could do it, but it's not happening now. So you do want to find out though where they have learning disabilities because kids with ADHD, many of them have learning disabilities as well. And many kids with learning disabilities also have ADHD as well. And that's going to be very important. Uh, also, uh, learning can be affected by ADHD. So I also evaluate kids for learning disabilities. Um, you know, you may know that if, if you have a learning disability like uh, reading, uh, you know, usually their um, cognitive scores are relatively good, but I, I saw a kid the other day actually has a math disability. His fluid reasoning is very low. So his verbal uh, abilities are very high, visual skills okay, but fluid reasoning is very low. And when I do the academic assessment, he's fine in everything but math. That's a math disability. He's not, he's not achieving his potential math. If a kid doesn't have a learning disability and they're a little bit older, you know, middle school teenager, um, and you do an evaluation, um, all of all of their learning scores, your academic achievement scores, are kind of lower than really they should be. And that's not where they should be, but not to the extent, not low enough to the extent that they have um, a learning disability. But what it is is that because of the ADHD, they have lost bits and pieces. They maybe didn't get all the steps in doing this kind of math problem. Or, you know, just, it's that kind of thing that you can see the effects of the ADHD, that they, that things that they were supposed to learn didn't happen, things weren't retained, and they're just not doing as well as they could. And then the other thing is that it's something else. And again, comorbid conditions, anxiety, depression, uh, things like that um, are common comorbid conditions. Um, now, sometimes somebody, you know, uh, genetically also has anxiety, depression, and so on. A lot of times I see uh, kids and adults with ADHD who have anxiety and depression, but it is secondary to the ADHD. It, it is a diagnosis because it's significant for them. But if you grow up uh, having people uh, being, I don't know, frustrated with you over and over again because you weren't doing what you're supposed to be doing, and you're smart enough to know that you know what to do, but you're having trouble getting it done, uh, you, you really don't begin to think, you begin to think poorly of yourself. You get anxious about things um, and, and down about yourself. 
So why school becomes so important is it's not just about the learning. It, it, what happens in school for that youngster is going to set them on a course for the rest of their life. One of the big things about ADHD is executive cognitive function. I am not a scientist, but there's a lot about ADHD. But uh, overall, the field is finding that executive functions are the main concern for uh, people with ADHD. And it's a developmental impairment of executive functions because they're not merging or unfolding as, as expected for age. And so what does he mean by executive function? Um, and this comes from Tom Brown. He's out in California. He's a fantastic uh, researcher and clinician. He's a psychologist. Um, and you can see here, will you do it? And if so, how and when? Will you do it has to do, to do with motivation and activation getting started. How will you do it? has to do with planning and organization. When will you do it has to do with timing and remembering. Um, there's no consensus on, you know, this, you know, these five or eight executive functions are the problem. Um, but we know that executive function is the problem. So any task that involve managing oneself, it could be on the playground, it could be sitting, it could be whatever, to prioritize, start, sustain, shift, stop, and integrate cognitive function. And anything that takes that kind of uh, frontal lobe thinking uh, is affected by executive function. And also using memory without moment by moment guidance from other people. Um, you know, kids, um, if you don't, uh, first of all, if you, you don't pay attention to what you're learning, it doesn't get into your long-term memory. That's why repetition for kids is so important, right? But it's also, um, you, you, you're not using your memory. You don't have a sense of time, how much time is passing. You, you don't have a sense of consequences. What happened the last time that I did this? Or, you know, this is what's going on right now. Oh, things will be fine tomorrow. You know, it's fine that I failed today's test. You know, tomorrow you're not going to be thinking about it. You're going to think it's going to be just fine. You're, you're not being able to use your executive functions to, to think ahead like that. Um, this is Brown's model of executive functions. And um, so I, as um, uh, we just went over some of them, the activation part, as he breaks it down more, is organizing, prioritizing, and activating to work, right? getting kids started. Focusing, the focus as it is focusing, sustaining your focus, and also being able to shift your focus from task to task. Whereas a, a teenager, I had a, a meeting with at the school with the school today and talked to him. Monday night, he, he was so frustrated. And this is two weeks into school. He's in all honors classes where he should be. He's a very bright kid. And he just kind of like said, you know, I know this stuff. I know what to do. I, but it, it's just too much. I can't get it all done. Um, that's frustration. But the, the, he, he, he definitely is having trouble um, regulating the alertness and sustaining effort. And then also the processing speed, how long it takes him to get something done. Emotion is managing frustration and modulating emotions. Memory, utilizing working memory and accessing recall, being able to pull it out. And then action has to be monitoring and self-regulating actions more kind of behaviorally. If you're an educator, uh, you might be thinking, I don't know if I can handle this, right? I've got a whole classroom of students that I have to be concerned about. And this uh, young boy, or girl, wonderful kid. It's so nice to talk to them. They're driving me nuts, right? Well, there are a few ways I try and help teachers to look at this. First, your ADHD student will be a great teacher for you. Everyone's different. You know that, but your student may be a challenge, but once you figure out the keys for working with that student, you will be much happier. The student will be much happier. You, you'll feel effective um, and you will um, rise to the challenge. You'll get it. Uh, your relationship with the student is vital. Like I said, 
kids with ADHD get a lot, a lot of negative feedback, even if no, people don't mean to be giving it to them. There's so many things that a kid with ADHD could be doing or not doing, like their work, that it, it's so, it, it's just, it, studies show they can have 2,000 more negative comments during a day than another kid. So your relationship and for the student to be able to trust you and for you to be able to talk with the youngster and about how you're feeling, how they're feeling, and for them to feel supported, even when they're frustrated, it's, it's, it's vital. I mean, that's what I like about therapy is, is a relationship and being able to get in with the youngster and that they feel supported. Having an understanding of ADHD and the tools uh, to work with is, is, is the best thing. Um, I say to parents, you, you can be the best parent in the whole wide world. But if you have a student with, that, with ADHD, it's not the same. It's not the same, you know. Um, it just takes a different set. It, it takes, it's parenting and teaching that you have to think about in, in how you're going to approach a kid, how are you going to work about chores, getting homework done or whatever. Um, it's just not so easy. Also, learning is a lifelong adventure, right? And we, we want our students to be excited about learning and handling its challenges. And that is so important also for kids uh, and students with ADHD because we want them to go to college. We want them to, uh, or uh, whichever work they want to do, the ADHD itself should not stop them. Yes, there are skills they need to learn, but even learning the skills doesn't mean that takes away ADHD. They still have to uh, um, deal with it. I, I used to say to kids, you know, once, oh, we know it's ADHD, and once we get some treatment for you, you know, it make things easier. I, I don't say that anymore. I, I say, you know what? It's doable, uh, but it, it, you do need to put in more effort than others. You, you know, other people, they, they, they can do, you know, uh, get down and do their work and not have to put effort into just the sitting down part and staying there. For you, it is going to be uh, harder like that, but it doesn't mean that it cannot happen. Uh, and then as an uh, educator, you also want to be able to get support. You know, you want to talk to people who can understand and, and can give you tips and, and, and recognize that if you're struggling, the, the kid must be having some issues too. What is necessary for a student with ADHD is also good for a neurotypical student who's having a bad day, right? What you would do for a student with ADHD is fine for the classroom. It, it's not um, changing anything. You, you're doing good things for that student that would help any kid. Um, but you can have the best kid in the world. If he's having a bad day, what would you do? You'd slow things down for him. You'd say, hey, uh, let me take care of this part for you. I'll, I'll help you get organized later. You, you would do the things that you would need to do to support that kid. For a kid with ADHD, they, they need that much, much more often. Now, if you're an educator, what is required for a student with ADHD? You're going to see, and you probably, I'm sure you have kids in your classroom now who you differentiate the learning. But when it becomes required for a student with ADHD, the, the two ways through it uh, in school is a Section 504 or an IEP. Um, the IEP, Individualized Educational Plan, is when you have a youngster um, who has a learning disability, maybe, so that's why they get specialized education. Um, they also have ADHD, and that can be included in the goals and the accommodations. Um, sometimes, if the youngster's uh, ADHD is so um, disabling in school that maybe they need a case manager or uh, maybe they, they need to um, go to an LD uh, resource room uh, to get things reinforced, um, they are, could be eligible for an individualized educational plan as a student with ADHD or other health impairment, OHI. And by the way, this is something that as um, Public Policy Committee for Chad were quite concerned about. There is no data taken anywhere about how many IEPs are written for kids with ADHD. And there's no data that shows how many IEPs are written where a kid has learning disabilities in a secondary uh, uh, eligibility category of uh, ADHD. There's no data with Section 504 that the federal government collects that says how many 
kids or have a Section 504 because of ADHD. And why this is so important is that how do you advocate for teacher training and teacher support when you can't say how many kids are affected by this? And what we eventually would like to see, actually, is that ADHD not be covered under OHI, but it becomes its own uh, eligibility category, just like a learning disability or speech language or autism, in some places, dyslexia on the in state level. Um, but we, we, we really don't know what the numbers are, although we know it's very high. So what's next? Well, I have academics here and frustration can result in behavioral issues. So we know that uh, a lot of kids with ADHD, there are behavioral issues. You know, what, what's the pattern? You know, is there a pattern here? Every time there's written language involved, writing. Um, writing itself is a common um, problem for kids with ADHD because um, if you have to write something out, you have to organize it in your head sequentially, right, word by word, and then you have to transfer it to paper or onto the computer one letter at a time. Um, the working memory load, much less of the kid, is the kid remembering what they had read anyway or what they're writing about. Um, and many kids with ADHD, a high number, have problems with fine motor skills um, and their handwriting's awful. So it is not, in, in, you know, the little kids will complain about how it hurts their hand. So a lot of the frustration, or as uh, Sydney Zentel once said, and she's a researcher at Purdue, um, if there's an academic issue, that's where you're going to see the frustration and behavioral issues. And if the child's having behavioral issues, you have to look at the academics, because that's the first place that you're going to find what's going on with that kid. So be concerned about academics. And then accommodations and teaching skills. How much is needed? There's no one thing for all kids. You know, um, a lot of school districts will have like Section 504 accommodations. Here's the set that we do. Well, how do you find out what that kid really needs? It's a problem solving exercise. What is the problem the kid is having in class? Um, how can we understand that problem through the ADHD lens? What do we know about ADHD and affecting that kid? And then how do we solve that problem knowing what the, from the perspective of, of ADHD? How long do you need this? I always put into my reports, accommodations, They maybe we don't want kids to always rely on accommodations. And, and if you can teach those skills, that's a good thing. But you can teach a skill and the kid would know what to do, but still have problems doing what he knows he needs to do at the time it's needed. That's a problem. Uh, some of them, you know, actually uh, accommodations you won't need in the future, but other accommodations the kid may need through college and into the workplace because uh, those issues are being so significant. And it can be very frustrating trying to remove accommodations from a kid and have a kid and have them kind of fall backwards again. They need the accommodations. They need the accommodations. There shouldn't be a problem with it. And what accommodations do is they facilitate learning to help the child learn. And uh, another biggie is facilitating the student's ability to demonstrate their knowledge. So, um, so let's talk about accommodations for a second. When you're treating a kid with ADHD, what happens in school is, is major, major. It's recommended for, that the focus for the student be on the mastery of the information being taught rather than the amount of work that is completed. It's recommended that classwork and homework assignments be altered so that they're only spending as much time on them as their peers. Uh, the latter part of it is uh, just because the child has a disability doesn't mean that they are um, supposed to do more than the other kids. Um, uh, I was in a meeting today and um, what the teacher said, uh, or actually the uh, 504 person said, well, you know, if he can't handle the workload in the um, AP class, then maybe he shouldn't be in the AP class. And I said, no, he has a disability. And as long as he has, um, um, if, if every other reason that he should be in that class is correct, you know, he's smart and all that. You, you cannot keep him out of that class because of his disability. That's why you do accommodations. Um, 
So this master of the information is most important. When COVID came along, uh, I came up with one that uh, I think is, is remarkable. And it's so good in my area that uh, everybody is adopting it. Uh, the, the schools are putting it in now uh, if they're doing the right thing. And it is that um, I, I never, ever request extra time for a kid to get their work done. Now, you probably know why. That if you uh, say, well, you know, let's just give them extra time to get that work done. Uh, what is it now? It is September. You might get September's work in December if you're lucky. Now, you won't get it in January because they're certainly not going to do it over the holidays. Maybe February if you're lucky. Uh, by the time you get into uh, October, if they have, don't have the work done that they were supposed to have done now so that you're getting to the end of the quarter, um, the kid's going to go nuts. And they're going to be so frustrated, um, be uh, totally overwhelmed. Um, the issue is not about the amount of work. The, the issue really is, do they know what they need to know? So what I recommend, and this is particularly for middle school and high school, not as much for uh, elementary school, uh, you'll see why. But um, I think that the way it is, is that uh, each teacher uh, needs to have a uh, weekly, at least weekly conference with their student to discuss how they're doing in the class how their assignments are going, uh, where are they at, if their long-term assignments, where are they at with that, help them to organize. And what I have found is that once teachers are spending that kind of time with the kid, and it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be a lot of time. I'm sure, if the kid is struggling, it's going to be some more time. But if the kid's not struggling that much, it's, it's, you don't need to spend much time. But um, the idea is to have a discussion with the kid. And you can say, look, I, I noticed that you're having trouble getting this assignment done. What, what's the problem? Um, and then you can say, uh, as I've had teachers say to me, so I was talking to the kid and I realized he knew the information. Uh, so I just said to the kid, well, tell me about this or that. They asked this question. Tell me about this or that. They said, absolutely. He knows the information. I'm going to give him an A on that. Why worry about the assignment? Or you can alter the assignment. You can say, hey, you know what? Uh, I can see that you've, you've got most of this down. Just do five more of those problems. Just do five more of the sentences. You really don't need to do uh, the 10 or 20 that's left there. Okay, you're good. Um, or it could be that um, yeah, maybe a kid has a um, better way, you know, if, if it's science class and you're asking for a written report about uh, cells, uh, and, and that's going to be, uh, and you know, from talking to this kid and from the uh, 504 that uh, writing is going to be a real problem. Uh, maybe the kid can, uh, um, is good with the hands and is into art. And maybe they can, you know, uh, draw something or they can model it, something hands on. And you're going to get the same information. You'll find out whether they know it or not. And that, that's a way to, to show it. Or, you know, if the kid has... Um, um, you know, if you, um, you know, again, if you can get it orally uh, or different from the kid writing, that's fine, too. So you, you can adjust the assignments. You can alter the assignments. And I, I, so I had this discussion with the school today because the initial 504 person who was kind of like didn't get it uh, brought in uh, the special ed coordinator. And she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. And so the special ed, uh, the 504 person said, well, so you're saying that teachers sit down with the kid and prioritize what they need to be done so the kid knows what to do. I said, yeah, that's not what I said. <laughs> but I said, that might be the solution, but I, I don't want to dictate, I don't want, I don't think the 504 should dictate how the teacher should do the accommodation. It's the teacher working with the youngster that's going to dictate what's the best accommodation to, to get where they need to be. Um, and remember when I said that having that relationship with the kid is so important? Well, that's how you have a good relationship with the kid because you're problem solving with them. And in fact, you're, you're talking to them. Well, how would you do this? Well, what are your thoughts on how you're going to do this? Have you thought of this? So there are ways that, that work like that. Um, um, additional time on tests, that's okay. But if you find that the kid is still struggling and it's not getting through the test, uh, it's too much, then it, it, it would make sense to 
uh, look at the test. You know, is it the way they're constructed that aren't working well, or is it too too many questions? But um, you, you alter, you not alter the test, but you, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I thought I tested what what you have to do. Teachers may say, I, you know, like I can't do all this stuff, you know, but you will find that the kids do better. You will be much happier with that kid, and they will have a good experience in your class this year because. You, you see their potential and, and you work to, to get it out of them. So um, that is, to me, um, one, one of the best accommodations. Um, another one I usually put in is if a kid gets a grade below a C on a graded assessment, it's recommended that teachers review the material, material orally with them. But then to see the material, they should get credit for the assessment and then gives you a chance to find out uh, what was wrong with the assessment that it, it was a problem for them or if they don't do uh, the, the you know you go over with them still don't know um, what happened with their studying where, where did things get messed up did they like this kid again today uh, one of the teachers was saying um, well you know uh, they, they, they uh, well, one of his accommodations actually is that he had a study guide for each uh, assessment and that the teacher uh, go over that study guide with him but prior to the test to point out where he needs to uh, put his focus. Because if you just say, oh, study all of this, the youngster is going to have trouble because it's way too much. Um, it, it's better to direct the kid to the areas that you know he may be weak with. Um, and why isn't uh, just uh, below a C and not a C? Well, most schools aren't going to guarantee greater than C, the average. Uh, but if, if you know that the kids at least average, if not higher from the evaluation, um, you wouldn't expect them to be getting lower than a C unless there's a problem. And the first problem that you should be thinking about is the ADHD. Kids with ADHD do have generally have slower processing speed. It does take them longer. So in class, um, if they're answering a question, got to give them time to think it through, right? Or they may start answering the question that you asked five minutes ago because they finally got around to thinking through what you had asked and then they have an answer for you. Well, I would encourage you to accept the question. If a kid is rushing through their classwork and not getting it done or getting it done way too quick or not getting it done really, is that the best thing to do is to chunk it. You give them you know, three questions on a page and you say, once you're done with that, you know, hand it up to me gives you a chance to take a quick look. Do they understand the uh, instructions? Do they know what they're doing? And then you give them the next three. And that way you're pacing the kid. So he can't just go and flip through the pages and do nothing. Or if the kid is like just spacing out, you know, they'll do a little bit and then you can keep, you can keep pace for them. Uh, and I find that to be very, uh, very, uh, very, very helpful. Uh, use um, formats with reduced written output. So instead of essay tests, it could be multiple choice, true, false, or full in the blank. You'll still find out whether the kid knows your material. Um, a couple of things on this, there's a couple of books. Um, and, and again, I can send this stuff to you. Promoting executive function in the classroom and executive function in education. Because again, the, the issue is how is it executive functioning causing these issues? And then how do we... Um, uh, accommodate for the dysfunction, but at the same time, how, what, how many of these skills can we teach? Okay. Now, the other thing I want to go into and talk about a little bit is positive behavioral interventions and supports. So let's say that the kid really is having behavioral issues. You have to think about the behavior in a very objective manner, you know, non-judgmental. What was happening before the behavior occurred and what happens afterwards? What are the antecedents and the consequences? And then analyze how it affects their behavior. So uh, if, you know, if it's academics, if it's writing, and, and, this, and then you see behavioral results, and then I'll see maybe they get out of writing or they push it off. But, you know, that, that's where you want to make the changes. Uh, but you have, want to design interventions that change the antecedents or the things that are reinforcing the behavior. Um, and then of course, you go back and evaluate, did it work or not? Just because you think it's going to work may not work for that youngster. I mean, everybody's different. And, and you really want to, as much as you can, is problem solve with the kid. This is what I noticed. What do you think is going to help? Because I want you to learn, right? Uh, and, I, and kids accept that. 
Um, but that doesn't mean that once you figure it out, it's going to work because any of these things, like if you have a good contingency management system in the classroom, lasts about two weeks and then the kid loses interest. So you have to be ready to rejigger it, you know, bring them back to it. Uh, one book I want to mention to you that uh, I, I, I love is by uh, Sidney Zentog. And as I grab it here, um, actually, I based my dissertation on work uh, that she did, uh, Sydney Zentel, Z-E-N-T-A-L-L. She came out with a book in 2000-something, ADHD and Education, uh, and it comes from Pearson, Foundations, Characteristics, Methods, and Collaboration. What is so great about how she writes about teaching kids with ADHD is not, not as much accommodations, but uh, kids with ADHD, you know, if you see a squirrel, you know, you get excited about it. Um, so it's a part of it's like, well, what do you emphasize? Like if you're teaching math, you know, three plus five equals eight, you, you know, what, what you might you usually put on the board, three, big letter, plus five, big number, equals eight. Well, she says, no, no, you want the child to focus on what's important. What's important is three plus five equals big. A, regular size, that's where you want them to focus. Um, her whole theory about ADHD uh, is that it, kids who are under aroused, you know, and if you were bored, what do you do? You find things to do to make things interesting to you, right? So, so she uses that. She says, you know, if a kid um, is bored and it's uh, whatever it is, is not moving and they can't, you know, it's not exciting, and they, and they can't seem to get it exciting. Well, they'll just make them mad. <laughs> you, you know, that, that, oh, that'll be interesting. That'll be a lot of fun now. Um, so her approach about how to teach things is very uh, important. And it could be a whole hour on what she has. But the book itself, it's uh, not a textbook. It, it, you know, certainly you learn stuff. Of, but it really is the examples of the studies she done, she's done to show how um, that kind of teaching really works for the young stuff. So for any learning math or reading that's below level score, what do you rec recommend? Pull out services or push in services? If it's an identified learning disability, one could say, it, you know, generally people would like uh, kids to be in the inclusion classes, you know, generally a class with uh, an additional um, special, uh, special ed teacher there to be helpful. At the same time, I know that does not always work. So in some ways, if it's, um, you have to use data, you know, if it's not working, you, know, you can say to the school, look, look at this IEP, this is the same goal we had last year, they're not moving and they're not moving fast enough um, and that you want more services, that's fine. Uh, it, it, it really comes down to, is the kid making good progress or not? Um, uh, it does lead me to say too that um, like kids with a reading disability and ADHD, um, a, a lot of, you know, like I said before, a lot of time the ADHD is affecting just the ability to stick to it. Assistive technology is very, very important. And whether your child has a 504 or an IEP, you can request a, a evaluation for assistive technology because as a kid gets older, it, it, it's going to be, you know, hard to, quote, you know, fix a learning disability Um so you really need to find ways to help kids get around it. And assistive technology is like speech to text uh, software or uh, text to speech where they can hear uh, and read at the same time. Um, it, it could be a lot of different things. And if you looked up assistive technology, but for most kids with ADHD, at some point, assistive technology is very, very helpful. It just kind of takes the pain out. It just facilitates they're being able to get that information in. An attendee writes, I appreciate what you're saying about each teacher making accommodations on the spot. For example, teacher number one alters assignments by saying, great, you get the concept, do four more problems and we're good. Should this be officially written in an IEP or 504 for the next teacher to do next year, say in math or um, science, et cetera? And how does it get documented or recorded to so that each teacher doesn't have to recreate the wheel each time? Well, and that's a good question. 
Um, that is the whole point of having Section 504, by the way, because, you, you know, before the, this year's teacher figure out what, that there is a problem, what that problem is, you know, they are, um, um, you know, you're in December already. That's the whole point of the 504 is to have these things documented and that these are things that teachers are doing and that you need to do. At the beginning of the school year, sometimes schools will say, well, we, you know, we don't do that anymore in, you know, middle school. I, I would never change anything on a 504 at the beginning of school. I would say, no, let's just keep doing it. Make sure the kid is, you know, these are things that work well. Uh, let's make sure that things are going well before we start to change things. And so that is the point because a 504 cannot be taken away by the school and they cannot change it independently. And this is true, too, for an IEP that... Um, they need to have your permission to change things. And, and um, I always tell parents, you have to train the school on what to do. Uh, you, you know, the kid's going to be there for a few years. They need to know what your expectations are and what's going on. Um, how um, does assistive technology help with mathematics and um, learning disabilities? Assistive technology could be... Um, um, a calculator, you, you know, um, uh, it may be, um, uh, I don't know if people are familiar with touch math, you know, kids who are trying to do it on their fingers, they, they need something like that. Touch math, that's what it's called, uh, is a much better way of um, getting kids to learn how to do math. Um, what are your recommendations if a student and educator have a strained relationship? If the teacher can understand why the relationship is messed up, then the teacher has some work to do to improve that relationship. Um, I, I, I don't know if it was Sidney Zentel who said one time about like behaviorally, um, you, you give the teacher um, you know, like uh, 10 pennies and what their job is to do is to move those pennies from one pocket to the other. How do they do that? Every time during class that they make a positive comment to the youngster, they get to move one of the pennies to the other pocket, right? So it's behavior, It's a behavioral uh, approach for the teacher. Um, that's their job is to find things to, um, um, to um, reinforce for the kid so that they begin themselves noticing what's going well with the youngster. I did see one here about where to get the uh, resource guide on ADHD. If you go to the Department of Education, federal, in the Office of Civil Rights of the Department of Education, and you put in a uh, resource guide for ADHD, uh, you'll get it. And it's, it's fantastic reading. It's very well written. Uh, it's easy. Uh, and it has things in there. Like if you have a student who's uh, maybe gifted or whatever, getting straight A's in school, but they have problems with that homework, then they could be eligible for a 504 plan because homework comes from school. So you can't have the school saying, well, he's doing just fine. You know, we, we don't need to write a 504 plan. You know, the government says that's, that, that's what uh, you know, uh, 504 is for. So it, it's very, very, very good and worth uh, having. If you have a kid who has ADHD, and, and listen for teachers also, because it really explains things very, very well. Someone had commented regarding the technology that there are numerous YouTube games, interactive manipulatives that can be used on smart boards or laptops that children enjoy and hold their attention. So I just wanted to share that with everybody else. I like that. Uh -huh. I like that. Well, we have a lot of great questions, unfortunately. Um, we're just uh, running out of time. So I want to remind everybody that um, we... Um, Chad are here as an organization available to answer any questions and Dr. Katz has provided his contact information. But if for some reason you did not get that information, you can send me an email. Um, I'm going to put that in the chat and then, um, or you can just uh, contact us through the, um, yeah. the office. Um, all right. Well, I appreciate your time and thank you for um, uh, sharing all of this great information for everybody and the resources. I really appreciate your time and I thank everybody for joining us this evening. I appreciate yeah. you guys being here and being patient as we are navigating Zoom webinars. <laughs> I'll, say, I'll say one more thing. So I'm presenting at the chat conference uh, coming up in November and it's going to be live as well as broadcast. And I'm going to be talking specifically um, about 504s and IEPs 
and how to manage, how to get them and how to manage the meetings to get what you need. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, have a great evening. And I hope to see you at the next webinar. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everyone.